Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the home stretch here. We have two uh, additional presentations for you. For you, Anna Vidovich will perform. That'll be our final act, if you will. But first, we're going to hear from Roland Griffiths. Dr. Griffiths is a professor in the departments of psychiatry and neurosciences at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His principal research focus has been on the behavioral and subjective effects of mood-altering drugs. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Griffiths. So for the next few minutes, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why I'm uh, so excited about some research that we've been doing on psilocybin and the experimental mystical experience. Psilocybin is the principal psychoactive component of the psilocybe uh, genus of mushroom. And this is uh, the so-called magic mushroom. Psilocybin in the form of these mushrooms have been used for hundreds, possibly thousands of years in, uh, in various cultures and structured manners for religious purposes. What I want to tell you about today is some research that demonstrates that psilocybin can occasion a very high probability mystical type experiences that appear virtually identical to naturally occurring mystical experiences reported by mystics throughout the ages uh, and uh, across different cultures. And as, as I'll describe, some of these findings uh, really surprised me and I think have very provocative implications. Just a bit about my background. I've been at Johns Hopkins doing uh, uh, psychopharmacology research on mood altering drugs of abuse for 35 years. About 15 years ago, I took up a meditation practice that really altered a coarse sense of self for me. Uh, and it got me asking questions about the nature of spiritual spirituality and mystical experience and how some of these kinds of sudden insights and mystical experiences can dramatically change people. It also prompted me to wonder about, uh, about the relevance of my own research program in drug abuse pharmacology until I became reacquainted with the claims mostly from the 1960s that uh, classical hallucinogens like psilocybin can occasion sometimes mystical experiences. And the idea of getting involved in research with that had just immediate appeal to me. Um, uh, and it, it allowed me also to kind of delve uh, more into the science of spirituality. Well, the idea of starting research on, on psilocybin is one thing. The, uh, actually, getting it done is another. At the time we initiated this project, which is about 10 years ago, research with the classical hallucinogens, human research, had been completely suspended for about 30 years. And this was largely because of the uh, uh, the drug excesses of the 1960s and, and that created an emotional charge around research with these compounds that lingers today. Well, after very close scrutiny by Johns Hopkins and Food and Drug Administration, we initiated a study in healthy volunteers of the effects of psilocybin. The uh, modest goal was to determine if we could safely evaluate both the acute and persisting effects of a high dose of psilocybin. 36 people were recruited locally. They were carefully screened because of concerns that psilocybin uh, might harm some people. All reported at least intermittent participation in spiritual or religious activities and none had any prior experience with a classical hallucinogen. Their average age was 46 years. They were highly educated, uh, high-functioning group of people. We had physicians, psychologists, uh, nurses, ministers, business people, a variety of, uh, of vocations represented. Each volunteer participated in two or three eight-hour sessions with two months between sessions. And although volunteers were told that they 
would receive psilocybin on, one, at, at, on at least one session. The design of the study effectively obscured to volunteers and to the session monitors exactly what other drug conditions might be administered. And this was to control for expectancy effects. And in fact, all of the volunteers received both a high dose of psilocybin and to control for expectancy, a high dose of the psychostimulant methylphenidate or, or Ritalin on different sessions. Before the se first session, monitors met with each participant on several occasions to establish rapport and trust, which is important for decreasing potential adverse effects from psilocybin. The eight-hour sessions took place in an aesthetic living room-like environment on our research unit. Participants came to the unit at eight in the morning, took capsules then that either contained psilocybin or methylphenidate. Two monitors were present throughout the uh, sessions. The participant was encouraged to lay on the couch, wear eye shades and headphones through which they listened to a program of classical uh, music. And they were encouraged to focus their attention inward on their inner experience. If a participant reported significant anxiety, which in fact does happen sometimes, then the uh, monitors were there to provide reassurance. Overall, it was our intention here to create a safe container for people to have their own experience. And the careful preparation and monitoring of the sessions was done because psilocybin can lead to dangerous behavior. When, uh, when given or taken under unprepared and unmonitored conditions. At the end of the session, and then at two months and 14 months, extensive questionnaires were completed and, and uh, structured interviews. So what did the study show? Well, as we expected, both psilocybin and methylphenidate produced effects that peaked at about two hours and then were gone at about six hours. Also, as we expected, psilocybin produced effects typical of hallucinogen drugs. So there were perceptual changes like visual illusions, greater emotionality, both pleasant like joy or peacefulness, and less frequently unpleasant, such as great fear, and cognitive changes, such as a change in sense of meaning or suspiciousness. But the most interesting finding was that for most volunteers, psilocybin, produced large increases in self-rated questionnaires that have been specifically designed to measure mystical experiences occurring in mystics uh, throughout the ages. Um, these are uh, questionnaires that have been extensively studied. They're, they've uh, demonstrated cross-cultural and cross-religious tradition generalizability, but they had never before been used in a, in a drug study. So in other words, on these measures, psilocy the psilocybin experience looks identical to naturally occurring religious experience. This shows some questionnaire data collected at the end of the session. It shows increases on several of the defining characteristics of mystical experience. In, in the uh, upper left, uh, what you're, and, and uh, the black bars are showing uh, psilocybin response relative to methylphenidate. So in the upper left, we're seeing the, the core defining feature of mystical experience, and that's unity. The strong sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things, a sense that all is one, sometimes experienced as pure consciousness. And that's accompanied by a sense of sacredness, this uh, noetic quality, uh, the sense that what is being experienced is more true and more real than everyday reality, a sense of deeply felt positive mood, love, or peace, transcendence of time and space, and the sense that the experience cannot be adequately described in words. Increases on all six dimensions are thought to be definitive of mystical experience, and. In this group of volunteers, over 60% met a priori criteria for having had a complete mystical experience. Now, although the physiological effects of psilocybin are gone by the end of session, the memories and thoughts about the mystical experience persist. So volunteers uh, returned at two months, 
completed various questionnaires, and this shows their, uh, their rating of how personally meaningful was the experience. And this is on a scale like an everyday experience at the bottom, uh, going up to among the top five or the single most personally meaningful experience of my life. The black bars show psilocybin. 70% of people were saying, this is among the five most personally meaningful experiences of my life. And I would, I would ask people, what, what does that mean? To tell me about that. And someone might say, well, gee, you know, when my uh, first child was born, my daughter, that changed my life forever. And recently, my father passed away. That was big. They say, it's, it's kind of like that. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Uh, here they are uh, filling out a questionnaire, how spiritually significant was the experience? Over 30% of these already spiritually inclined people are saying that this is the single most spiritually significant experience of their lives. 70% are rating it in the top five. So when we initiated this study, I'd hoped to, that we might come across something interesting, but frankly, I was unprepared for these kinds of reports, so much so that we ended up adding these last two questionnaires that I've described after we had run the first couple of volunteers, because it was is clear that we didn't have any scale that was going to measure the extent of attribution that people were we're going to make to this experience. And, and frankly, it was surprising to me. In my 35 years of doing psychopharmacology research with a whole variety of drugs, I've never seen anything such, so unique and powerful and, and, uh, and enduring in terms of memory of drug experience. On a different scale, 80% of the volunteers said that the experience increased their sense of well-being and life satisfaction. No one said it decreased. It. Uh, another questionnaire assessed changes in attitudes and moods and social effects. People were making claims that they had more personal uh, integration, enthusiasm, self-confidence. In terms of mood, they reported increased love and joy. Positive social effects claimed to be more perceptive, compassionate, increased positive relationships. And it wasn't just the volunteers who were reporting these kinds of effects. Uh, we also interviewed friends and family members before, during, and after sessions. And these ratings show these same kinds of positive effects after uh, psilocybin. These positive memories and the positive attributions really don't appear to diminish in time. At 14 months follow-up, the ratings of meaning and spiritual significance and all these other attributions are essentially unchanged from two months. And here at 14 months, we have, in their own words, I've pulled out four quotations from volunteers describing the experience. The first one, the part that continues to stick out for me was the knowing and seeing and experiencing with every sense and fiber of my being that all things are connected. Another one, the sense that all is one, that I experience the essence of the universe and the knowing that God asks nothing of us except to receive love. A third one, uh, the feeling of no boundaries where I didn't know where I ended and my surroundings began. Somehow I was able to comprehend what oneness is. And finally, the understanding that in the eyes of God, all people, Abusers, abused, Christian fundamentalists, Muslim fundamentalists, atheists were all equally important and equally loved by God. And that, given the cir proper circumstances, I could be any one of them. So what are the implications? Well, that psilocybin can occasion in most people studied mystical type experiences virtually identical to naturally occurring experiences suggest that such experiences are biologically normal. That is, we're wired for these kinds of experiences. Another Im very important implication is that such experiences are now, for the first time, amenable to systematic, prospective experimental study. 
And so that's one of the reasons that I'm so excited about this. There's so many different directions to take off on understanding this phenomenon. So from the perspective of biological psychiatry, it'd be interesting to explore how factors such as personality or genetics affect the likelihood of having such an experience. What would happen if confirmed atheists were recruited as volunteers? What would happen if you recruited people who were interested in undertaking a meditation or spiritual awareness practice? In fact, that's a study that we've just started. From the perspective of neuroscience, it would be valuable to know what brain pathways are activated. And so we can do a whole series now of reductionistic scientific questions to look at the neurophysiology and the neuropharmacology of these kinds of experiences. A third direction is clinical application. There are, are there possible therapeutic applications that could be harnessed here? So taking off on some older uh, research, we're currently conducting a study to see if psilocybin occasion mystical experience has psychologically therapeutic effects in cancer patients who are suffering from anxiety or depression secondary to the existential crisis of their disease. And the preliminary results indicate that the cancer patients are indeed experiencing the same kinds of shifts in positive attitudes and, and moods, often secondarily affecting family members. On a personal level, I can tell you it's deeply moving to see such shifts in people who are actively contemplating their own passing. A second therapeutic application that we're just beginning to explore is whether psilocybin can facilitate a treatment of substance dependence by opening a spiritual window for the individual, as had been tried back in the 50s and 60s. But aside from the experimental questions, the scientific questions, I think there's a larger and more exciting ontological question to be asked. And that is, why? Whether occasioned by psilocybin or not, why is the human organism wired to have such experiences? A profound, uplifting, enduring sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things. An experience that's arguably foundational to human ethical and moral codes that seem to be part of all the world's religious and spiritual traditions. Well, some might say it's all evolutionary biology that what we're doing is promoting reciprocal caretaking and that's important for survival. Could be, could be. But others might uh, point out that unconditional love and respect for everyone, which is the core of this experience, for everyone, isn't always adaptive for personal survival. I think Jesus Christ, Gandhi, or other, other people who have been persecuted for holding such worldviews. It seems to me that there's a great mystery embedded within human consciousness. A mystery that I think that we're all aware of at some fundamental, even primitive level. Having something to do with this quest to understand who we are, the essence of life, perhaps with this deep knowing that at some level we're all in this together. Excitingly, it appears that systematic work investigating these mystical type experiences may provide unique information about the mechanisms, both biological and otherwise, underlying human moral and ethical behavior, knowledge that I believe may ultimately be critical to the survival of the human species. Thank you.